Well, good Friday, everyone. I get to say good Friday every Friday on Fred Plotkin on Fridays, but today, April 7th, more so than ever, because it is Good Friday for people who observe that. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Idagio, the place where classical music happens. Idagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to music lovers around the world. That includes North and South America, the United Kingdom, where my guest is today, all of Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Outer Islands, Antarctica, I suppose, the penguins down there, and especially our loved ones in Ukraine. Stay strong. We are with you. Today, my guest is a wonderful artist whose work I've heard, I've never met her before our conversation today, uh, Rachel Nichols, a soprano, we'll call her that without category, from the United Kingdom. Welcome, Rachel. Hi, it's really real pleasure for me to be here with you all this Good Friday. Thank you. Now, Rachel and I technically met a few months ago when we were both on the BBC on the World Service on a weekend program called The Food Chain. And I say technically because her conversation was recorded independent of my conversation, but was so effectively edited by the program that it felt all of a piece. And the subject of the program was, what do opera singers eat before, during, and after performances as part of their daily regimes and so on? And um, Rachel is an opera singer. I have worked with countless opera singers, and I'm also the author of eight books on Italian food, and therefore know my way around a kitchen as well, and have cooked for many, many singers. And Rachel, because that program, The Food Chain, covered it really well, we're just going to do this briefly, but talk about your regime for eating as an opera singer. Well, yeah, it kind of depends whether I'm working or not working, because when I'm not working, I really love my food. I will eat everything and anything. I There's pretty much no food that I don't like. And I am really adventurous. I like trying little independent restaurants. I like um, trying out new recipes. I try and eat, you know, a plant-based diet some of the time for environmental reasons. So I'm very adventurous with my vegetarian food, but, you know, I've eaten live minnows in Japan and um, (laughs) um, things that are still wiggling, certainly. Um, And in fact, it became a bit of a dare with my Japanese colleagues at one time after we had finished performing. And the reason I say that is because when I'm actually working, I have to be super boring about my food and make sure that there's nothing that's going to give me food poisoning or acid reflux or any of these other horrible things that could affect my singing. So I kind of waver madly between being super adventurous with my eating and really dull and mainly living on rice cakes, avocados and bananas. And let's say you're about to sing a Zolda, and that's a long haul. Yeah. What would Rachel as a Zolda eat, and when would she eat it? Well, she'd have a good breakfast, because I firmly believe that um, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And for my breakfast, I normally have some kind of nice bready thing. Like, I'm very fond of crumpets. In fact, I'm slightly obsessed with crumpets and butter. And with that, I would have some either plant based or cow's milk, Greek yogurt um, with honey and some fruit. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what I have for breakfast every day. And I have that when I get up. And then, I mean, sometimes these operas start pretty early on because you can you can be performing all afternoon and into the evening because often the audience has a supper interval where they get to eat really nice picnics and I get to eat rice cakes. Um, (laughs) Um, At lunchtime, I will eat something with protein because I know that's going to keep me full up. So maybe some chicken or some fish, or if I'm having a planty day, I'll have something with lentils, maybe some lentil soup. Um, And then during the show, I will snack and graze depending on how I'm feeling my energy levels are. And I stick to very plain food. I like avocados. They keep me full up and they feel like they're good for me. Um, it may be a myth, but I'm, I'm again, I'm slightly obsessed with avocados with black pepper on. Um, well, and avocados I, are rich in a very good oil. 
This is good to know. My instinct is they're doing me good. (laughs) It's a very, it's like olive oil. It's a very healthful oil for you. I eat loads what does your oil. absolutely gorgeous border collie eat? My border collie, right? So this is really funny. When we were rehearsing in, um, when I was rehearsing in Switzerland for my first Electra, I soon realised that in order to be able to afford to live and take any money home at all at the end of the gig, it was better for me to be a vegetarian. But I bought breast of chicken for my border collie and cooked <laughs> it for her every day because I am like a very, very um devoted dog mum and I love my dog she eats dry kibble and she has extra chicken or an egg or something nice to boost her protein on top she's grain free because according to my very expensive dog trainer my dog is hyper enough without being more hyper because of grains so I just went with that and yeah she's a happy girl she's um she's joining in with this conversation by trying to make me play fetch with her that is fine good Uh, she has this rubber ring that she loves perfect you know, every now and again, I'll be turning away from my microphone to throw the rubber ring. It'll keep it with happy. your repertory. <laughs> the ring is perfect. It is. <laughs> I have a friend who lives outside of London who has two magnificent border collies and he's a big opera lover. And these dogs have learned to calm down enough to listen to God to Damarung or Meister Singer and not only get through it, but they seem actually somewhat engaged. At least one of the dogs does. And um, um, it's yeah. a fantastic breed yeah they are incredible dogs i mean in basel i took juno with me to basel as as i said because i fed her chicken and because the um the the general music director at the time um eric nielsen was was the with the gmd in um, basel and he's a great dog lover so he used to let me take her to rehearsals and she used to sit under the piano during Mm -hmm. electra and she didn't she didn't mind the loud singing. In fact, she has been known to actually curl up and go to sleep under Sir John Tomlinson's chair while he's been singing. And that is that. possibly the loudest sound in opera is Sir John <laughs> Tomlinson. So, yeah, she's she's grown up with, with very loud noises in her background. <laughs> now, serious question. That I, I It is a very serious question. I've known many opera singers who are dog lovers and have dogs as part of their family and travel with them. And Franco Corelli, who I knew, had basically the same breed of dog. And when uh-huh. one would go, another would arrive of the same breed. And Margaret Price, Dave Margaret Price, loved her golden retrievers. And when I was performance manager of the Metropolitan Opera, Margaret Price came to sing Desdemona with Placido Domingo as Otello. And Margaret Price insisted that the, her dog, I, I always forget it was Contessa or Princess, it was one of those names, be allowed to sit in the wings during her performance because Margaret Price said that she received calmness from her dog. I However... Mean- <laughs> if, if you're singing Desdemona and Placido Domingo is straddling you with a pillow and killing you and your dog's in the wing and you're in front of 4,000 people at the Met, how do you do that? And I decided that I had to hold the golden retriever by the chain, by the leash, to prevent her from going out on the stage. But you heard these blood curdling howls from the dog. <laughs> that is <laughs> and absolutely Price, the best story I've ever heard. Margaret Price, her head down under the pillow, <laughs> was doing this to the dog to try to convince the dog, I'm okay, I'm okay. <laughs> it was an Otello unlike any other, and Domingo had to run away from the dog after for fear of having his leg chewed. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, because the dog would be very protective. Um, I Juno is, to some extent, my emotional support dog, as in she's terrific company. And, you know, she, if, you know, what, however bad things get with, um, you know, you, you may not get a job that you went for, or you don't feel you sang very well, last night or you know that you've you've got a really big job with some very difficult music to learn you know you have to get up and you have to go for a walk every day if you have a dog and I find Mm. that that is a wonderful thing but I think really I am Juno's emotional support human because she's very neurotic and um, yeah I do take her with me but not when um, I feel it's going to be adversely affecting her mental health put it that way you're her chief of staff (laughs) yeah absolutely Um, 
one more dog story. I could do an hour of dog stories in opera, but not for now. I could do two more. One is that Luca Pizzadoni, the bass baritone, bass, um, has two dogs. I believe that one is the golden retriever and the other is the dachshund. The golden retriever is very mellow. The dachshund is very animated and likes to be the center of attention. And I've seen that little dog appear with Luca on stage when he's played the Count in Le Nozze di Figaro, <laughs> and the dog acts perfectly. It is completely right. in sync with Luca and has no stage fright. So there's that. And then there's the very famous story, true, because I was present for it, I witnessed it. Um, we were doing Manon Lesco at the Met, and alternating were Leona Mitchell and Morella Franey. And Leona Mitchell was in the first cast, and there was a little lap dog that she held up and sang to it and the dog started to quiver and peed on her beautiful costume and <laughs> leona mitchell kept singing and sort of handed the dog away and then when the staging came and franey came in she heard of what happened and franey was seeing they hand her the dog and she said no 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 and she moved the dog away <laughs> as quickly as possible without giving up her singing so there maybe another time you and I will do a show about dogs in opera because I think that would be good. <laughs> wonderful. Another one, the famous uh, again at the Met, Rosen Cavalier, in which two dogs became so there's an animal seller in the first act, became so aroused by the music that they proceeded to make love on the stage while the Marshland was singing. Anyway, <laughs> let's go back <laughs> to Rachel. It's true. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Let's go back to Rachel Nichols. <laughs> You're from Bedford. Where is Bedford? Bedford is an hour north of London on the train. Um, uh, yeah, what's it near? near. I, I know the UK well, but I don't think I could find Bedford on the map. It, it's near London. I mean, it, it, that's the biggest okay. landmark. It, there is a, a, a place called Milton Keynes you might have heard of. Oh, because sure. That was a, a kind of... Experimental oh, town. Experimental town. It's near yeah. there too. So it's it's between those two places. Got it. Very good. So um, one thing I was delighted to learn in doing my research about you is that you studied with Dame Ann Evans. Yeah. Yes, I did. I met and got to know in New York. She sang Leonora in Fidelio here. And I believe she sang Elizabeth and Tannhäuser with Tatiana Troianos. Is Rhino Goldberg it was a wonderful cast, and um, she was very special. She's Welsh. Um, Wales has this magnificent singing tradition. She is a lovely colleague. A part of it, I mean, really delightful, and not in a fake collegial way, but just genuinely grounded and sharing and caring and so that told me a lot about you not knowing you that part of your formation is Dame Ed Evans would you talk about her um Annie is probably after my immediate family my favoritest person on the planet I absolutely adore her and she has been so kind and so generous and so good to me personally but it's not just to me personally she is a very warm giving human being and she mm -hmm. is just a legend I mean I listen to her recordings and I cannot quite believe that she is prepared to take the trouble to help me with my singing because I listen to that world class and wonderful instrument and the way that she span these incredible lines of almost rose gold, luminescence in Wagner, um, singing it so musically, it almost sounds like big Mozart and the dynamic range that she used and this beautiful warmth of tone and it's almost like her personality is being expressed entirely through her singing, because as, as I say, she's just this wonderful, warm, generous human being. Um, don't get me wrong. She says what she thinks and she can be extremely rude when um, me or any of um, any more of the, the younger cohort are not doing what she likes. And that's brilliant because I'd much rather somebody said when something isn't very good than sort of pretended that it was OK and just, you know, said nice things. 
um she's uh, she's she lost no time at all in telling me she didn't think I was doing a very good job when I first started off singing this repertoire. And I hope I've taken all of her advice very, very much to heart. And every time I take a new piece to her or an old piece that I've not sung for a while, I have a sensible mix of trepidation and excitement about what she's going to say. And, you know, yeah. she's just so great that she's still prepared to work with me apart from on Electra she doesn't really approve of me singing Electra so she won't help me with that <laughs> would she want you to sing Chrysotomus or not go anywhere near that opera well no she did want me to sing Chrysotomus and when I was first approached by Eric Nielsen about the two roles he gave me the choice now that's an incredible honor and privilege to be given the choice of two different roles in this incredible Strauss music and I tried with Chrysotomus. I tried to sing it in for three or four months. And at the end of three or four months, my husband came in and very helpfully and supportively said, Rachel, that still sounds completely rancid, which was um, true, but hard to hear <laughs> because I'd really worked on it very, very hard. And at that time, there He's was a, a baritone. He is. <laughs> He wanted you to sing or rest to him. That's all. Uh, well, I, I think he he's just... Uh, He's from the north of England and very blunt. Um, and again, I'd rather I'd rather know in advance before taking this out in public that it still sounds horrible. And there was a particular bit of my technical puzzle of working out how to sing, which, you know, you think, well, she should have really done that by the time she was 40. But, you know, we're all learning all of the time. And there was a certain little component that I hadn't quite fixed. And that made it simply impossible for me to sustain the tessitura of, of chrysotomus weirdly i think i could do it now because i now have assembled that piece of technical information but now no one's going to ask me to sing chrysotomus because i now sing a lecture um that aside um i thought i'm gonna have to tell eric i can't be in this opera because everybody says i must sing chrysotomus and everybody says i mustn't sing a lecture and then i thought i will just look at the monologue and it was like putting on a pair of shoes that fitted perfectly the first time. And I thought, well, it's right for everybody else to sing Chrysotomus first. It would be dangerous for me to sing it. It's it's very fatiguing for me to sit up at that tessitura. I don't think it sounds nice. Electra, that feels comfortable. I do not get fatigued by singing this opera. And I think for me, it was the right decision because everybody is ultimately very different. I want to ask you a very technical question about Electra, which is one of my very, very favorite operas by far. Um, I've worked on numerous productions. I just adore it. Um, she's on stage almost all the time. The it's opera kind of a one-woman show. Yeah. It's yeah. a one-woman show with guest appearances by other amazing characters. That's a good That's way to put it. That's not to say the other people have not very much to do. They all have a lot to do, but Electra is just there the whole time. And we're getting back here to the question of sustenance, that many Electra sets that I've walked through have crevices, have cubby holes, where beverages, where food, where things are stored. How? Because she requires galvanic energy and lots of hydration. How, in terms of that, do you get through a performance? And is the set design required for you that you have these sources for beverage and food? Amazing. So um, in Basel, I had it was uh, the, the set was like a child's bedroom. And it was all sort of pink things covered in stage blood. And I had a pink water bottle. And actually, I did the whole show yeah. without water for the first three shows. And then I, the fourth show, I think it was the fourth one, I had a touch of laryngitis. And my cover was sicker than I was. So they said, oh, you've got to go on and sing anyway. And I said, do you know what? I can do it, but I need a bottle of water. Would it be okay if I covered my water bottle with some fake blood and put it on the stage? And from then on, because no one minded, I did have my water bottle. And whenever I needed a drink, I just went over and, and, and had one. And, and the production was flexible enough to accommodate that. Um, in Karlsruhe, I'm trying to remember if I drank or not. I There was, yes, I secreted a water bottle 
behind the steps and there was one place where I got to go up the steps onto the higher level of the set it was a set on three levels and I was able to have a sneaky drink just before the arrest scene which for Mm -hmm. me is where I need to drink because I need to sing nicely in the arrest scene because it's this most glorious music and I'm a very lyrical artist sing after doing quite a lot of um, slightly, there's a technical term, slightly more shrieky singing. So it's it's important to to feel that I'm on top of things. Um, In the production that I have just done in Munster, there was one chance to drink, which was when I took a chair off stage because I didn't have enough to do. I also had to move quite a lot of scenery. Um, And then I I had a sneaky drink then. And I, but the costume had pockets in it. So I was able to secrete secrete these incredible singer suites called Gelo Revoice, which are magical. Mm -hmm. And they make you feel like you've had a drink of water, even if you haven't. So I could have a sneaky suite if I needed to. The current Met production is a famous one that's seen in many theatres by Patrice Chiro, the late Patrice Chiro which is sort of a square gray set. I like the production. It's There are issues I would change, but I do like it a lot. Um, but there's not really a place for Electra to have her goodies. The previous production was an Otto Schenck that had the tall house of Agamemnon behind, and in front of it, a broken statue of a horse that was broken in two. And Electra had a whole little cabinet in there of sources of food and drink like a pantry that's like really pantry, very big. exactly yeah. inside the horse and All occasionally the when the serving women would come on or or her mother Nesta, would come on electra would go back inside the horse for a moment and i knew what she was doing yeah <laughs> but she was probably eating way. a banana <laughs> exactly it's the only way so i want to go back to ann evans sure because it's very valuable and she's someone I esteem greatly. And, you know, I like your work when I've heard you and I was try. I don't know much about you. And when I discovered that link, it makes a lot of sense to me now. And how do you work a role with her? Talk about a session with her, whether working a role or just doing technique. Yeah. Um, I would say that what Anne, Anne describes how she wants the role to sound And she gives me a certain amount of technical expertise about how to achieve that. But but some of the time she doesn't. Some of the time she says, no, I want it to sound like this. And she leaves the technical working out how to do that to me. So we really she she has an end product very clearly in her mind about how she wants it to sound. And this this would be different depending on who she's working with, because obviously she's not going to have the same end product in my voice as she would have with um, my wonderful friend and colleague, Lee Bissett's voice, who also works with Anne, um, because we're, we're very different, even though we sing quite a lot of the same repertoire. So in terms of the actual sound, um, she, as I say, she she has a, she has a goal in mind, and I will work technically to achieve that. And I will try out different things, and she'll say yes, I prefer that, or no, that sounds ghastly. Um, you know, and she's she also will has been very very generous with her time, and has come to watch me in not not just performances, but also in rehearsal. So she will be able to see how the sound is working in a big space as well, and that's absolutely invaluable because so you know you you can't give a, com- a complete um indication of how you're going to sound in a big theater in someone's living room you know so it's it's incredible that she she goes to do that but it's not just technical singing that she's helping me with because Anne has herself lived and breathed all of these roles that I sing apart from Electra which she never sang herself yeah. so but if we're working on Isolde or on any of the Brunhildes, she will um, be absolutely categorical about, this is the best place to breathe. You need to take this extra breath here because your diaphragm will get tired if you're breathing too frequently in the following page. And she, because she has been through this and done this in all of these incredible theatres and with the incredible orchestras, and with the incredible conductors that she's worked with, yes. she's able to give me all, an insight into all of that experience and kind of give me a microcosm of the very best way to do it. And then I can go into my first day of rehearsals 
absolutely impeccably prepared. The conductor may very well change what he wants me to do because it's up to the conductor to put his interpretation, his unique stamp on it. But at least I know that if I've gone with all of Anne Evans's notes in my score, I'm at least not going to be told off for being underprepared or, you know, um, doing something wrongly because it will be an interpretation that's already incredible. Even if he then changes it, I've done my homework properly. So that's brilliant. So she she takes me through every single role, phrase by phrase, and we work on absolutely everything. Even if it's a tiny little phrase in the middle of somebody else's scene, she's very strict about the text because Anne herself was certainly a very text-led singer. She knows exactly what, not just her lines. I mean, this sounds very, very obvious, but often people in the audience ask me, do you speak German? Do you understand what's going on? And I say, yeah, I do understand what's going on because otherwise I couldn't pull the right face at the right time. But there are many artists who do not speak the language that they're singing. I, a famous singer had never sung in Russian and she was... Uh -huh spoon fed Russian to do Tatiana brilliantly and Eugene yeah. Onegin, but she didn't speak Russian. Yeah. And there are, I have encountered many, 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 many singers I've worked with who don't, they know in translation what they are talking about, but they don't know when, for example, to, if they're singing Tosca, to know how to reply to Scarpia at a key moment because they don't know what he's saying. Well, this is the thing. And certainly Anne has has definitely trained me. And I hope I sort of vaguely knew this before I started working with Anne. But you can't just only understand your lines. You do actually have to understand what everybody else is singing to, not just you, but also to each other. Because even if someone's not speaking to you on stage, you have to understand what they're singing so you know how to react. And yep. certainly your musical phrasing will always be first and foremost informed by your text particularly in Wagner, because as we know, he wrote all of his own libretti. And certainly Cosima Wagner, after Wagner died, was absolutely adamant that the text had equal importance with the music. And this is how this very declamatory style of singing Wagner, which became rather unflatteringly known as the Bayreuth Bark, became <laughs> fashionable in Germany. Wagner was sung by bel canto singers everywhere else, but in Germany, yep. in Bayreuth, under Cosima, in the sort of Wagner's home, it was sung in this very declamatory style, very heavy on the consonants. And now I hope that together with Anne, I've worked out a kind of compromise between those two things. I think I get more and more bel canto as I go through my career because um, I guess I've decided the music sounds nicer that way. <laughs> Speaking of the Bayreuth Bark, just briefly, <laughs> you know that Wagner is buried with Cosima and right nearby his dogs are buried. His children are buried much further away. But he really loved his dogs. Wagner he did was love his dogs. Deeply unpleasant man in, in lots and yeah. lots of ways. But he was a great dog lover. There's, isn't there this wonderful story about how his dog went missing and he found his dog wandering on, on Oxford Street or Regent Street when he was visiting London? I don't know that story. Yeah, I, it, I, I encountered it while I was looking through his letters, researching an article I was writing on the Wesendonk leader a few mm -hmm. months ago, and I found out the story about this dog. So clearly he was very attached to his dog. Well, in Die Valkyrie, there's a character <laughs> named Hunding. Hunding, not a very nice character, I have <laughs> to say. Nice it's the only time my husband and I have been married on stage was as Sieglinde and Hunding, and it didn't end well, let's just put it that way. <laughs> well, it didn't end well for him. I guess later <laughs> on it didn't end well for her either. She gives him what Anna Russell called the Mickey Finn and he goes off to sleep and she gets to stand stage with Zygmunt and and pull a sword out of a tree, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's some very dodgy stuff that really twins shouldn't be doing with each other. No, but then Siglinda gets maybe the best melody in the entire ring side. Oh, she way. definitely yeah. does. You know, every time I'm singing Brynhild, she's got the best phrase. <laughs> but actually, this leads me to a question before we get back to Anne Evans that I wanted to ask you when you were talking about Chrysotomus and Electra, I've known sopranos who have sung Siglinda and Brynhilda and have actually gone back and forth and have not graduated, so to speak, from Siglinda to Brynhilda. I hope that's still possible because I, I've done Sieglinde in concert and I 
I was very, very ill back in 2016, 17. And I was booked to do Zieglinda at Grange Park Opera. And I was absolutely gutted. It was the one job I had to pull out of while I was recovering because I simply didn't have... That, well, I was too ill to go to the rehearsals, yeah. even though they, they were absolutely marvellous at Grange Park Opera. And they said that they would keep the role open for me if I was able to go back just before the performances. They couldn't have been nicer about it. Mm-hmm. But I, I was unable to do that job and I missed my chance of doing Zieglinder on stage. So yeah. I really hope I can do it one day because the music is just sublime. And I personally see no reason why you can't go from one to the other. I think the important thing is that Zieglinde and Brunhilde sound very different to each other mm-hmm. because otherwise the audience's ear will get a little bit tired of the, the sort of same variety of shrieky singing going on. Um, so but- how as a singer do you do that? How do you vary your sound? How do you vary oh. your sound enough that you would be able, an audience member who's alert would be able to distinguish between Brunhilde and Zaglinda, is it a technical thing for you as a singer? It is absolutely it can notes? be. It absolutely can be. So um, for a start, the role of Zieglinde sits a li- even a little bit lower than the role of the Valkyrie Brunhilde. Valkyrie Brunhilde is a crazy role because you have to sing really, really high as the first thing you do in the Hoya to Hose, the very, very famous battle cry. Then the rest of the opera is really quite mezzo. It's, it's, it's almost like it's written for a mezzo voice. Zieglinde sits even a little bit lower than that, I think, in terms of its core tessitura and colour. But Zieglinde has a lot more lyrical music to sing than Brunhilde. Brunhilde's music is very feisty, apart from the the Tour des Verkündigen, where she is announcing that to Siegmund that he is to die and that he's to follow her to Valhalla. Of course, he says he won't, um, which rather upsets her plans because she has it oh, all What a down. moment. That yeah. moment is just so glorious it's there incredible. Are famous moments in the opera that we all know but that one to me is where because we can talk about this in a moment i teach the ring all over the world and i've been to 48 complete cycles i talk about Br- the character brunhilde as someone who is continually being educated and takes what she learns and applies it intel for the most part intelligently not every case but most part and that's a key moment in her education Definitely. Because even before she's stripped of her godly powers, she learns that there are other ways to approach life and relationships from that moment with Sigmund. And she's fascinated by this idea of human love. And it's yeah. it's without that experience with Siegmund, she would never be able to fall in love with Siegfried. So this is really, really important for Brunhilde. But in general, her music is very impassioned. She's very young. She's very innocent, and and she she gets really up into the the, the soprano tessitura in Act Three when she's pleading for her, effectively pleading for her life and her her um, future with Wotan. Zieglinda's music is much more romantic and lyrical. It sits lower down in the voice, and we have choices about what colors we use as singers. Obviously the core sound of somebody's voice is is pretty much instantly recognizable. And how you cast an opera, I mean, obviously you know far more about this than I do really, because you you sat on the other side of this, but how you cast an opera, you know, you you need two dramatic sopranos. You need a, a Zieglinder and a Brunhilde. Now you can, You can sort of do it either way. You could have the lower set, richer voice singing Zieglinde. That would work very, very well. And the brassier, brighter voice singing Brunhilde. But you could equally do it the other way around. The brassier, brighter voice could actually use a lighter approach. And that would work absolutely fine for Zieglinde's youth and the beautiful lyrical music not being too dark and heavy. So there's a number of different ways that you could cast the opera. But there's also, we have choices as singers about which colours we're going to use. I hope that in my paint box, and my paint box gets bigger all the time as I learn to do more technical things with my voice. I use all of the colours I used to use for my Baroque singing, all the way through to the most dark, mezzo-y, Nina Stemmery. I wish I could make the Nina Stemmery noise, but, you know, as far as I can get towards that with my instrument, which is, um, you know, only my instrument. Um, it's and I have all of those colors too and it's picking the right ones and I hope that I would still have enough of those choices to pick some nice colors for Zieglinder um one casting 
option that I've often been involved in when we do that opera is that we think of Sieglinda as womanly and Brunhilde as virginal. Yes. And therefore we can make allowances for the sound of the more virginal Brunhilde. You know, it's kind of like a, a Puritani, son Virginia Vetsosa, that I'm just a, a happy little virgin girl. Brunhilde is not quite that, but Wagner was very inspired by Bellini. Whereas unquestionably, Zeglinda has more life experience. Not she all definitely of it does. And therefore, that can be factored into the voice and the casting in different Absolutely. ways. So Carita Matila made a wonderful Zeglinda a few years ago in San Francisco, primarily because she brought life experience sure. that a Brunhilde would not have. And it was just phenomenal to watch and, and to hear. So my going back to my Ann Evans question, of which I could have many, have you ever had the opportunity to work with a conductor that she sang with? Um, she certainly did sing for Anthony Negus because he conducted her at Welsh National Opera. And Anthony taught, well, I say he taught me the ring, but I did my first ring cycles with Anthony and my first Tristan with Anthony. Um, so and. Um, also, Anne worked a lot with Sir Richard Armstrong, and I've been lucky mm -hmm. enough to do just act two of Tristan with Sir Richard. But that was an incredible experience. And the the most I think the most practically the most wonderful thing anybody has ever said to me was him saying afterwards that he could tell that I had worked with Anne. And for me, that was such an enormous accolade because it was the biggest compliment he could have paid me, really. <laughs> Part of my question was that you said earlier that ultimately the conductor brings what he or she wants. And so my thinking was that if you worked with a conductor that Ann Evans worked with, perhaps that conductor would bring the same desire in your interpretation of a role as Ann Evans, or perhaps the conductor would say, these are two different artists with their different strengths and tones and colors and so on, and want something different. but. I know that so much in opera is about what the Italians call tramandare, to pass down this oral education, this oral tradition that happens in opera, where we learn from others. And I attend master classes and sometimes give them, but I, I attend as many as I can because I learn from the other artists and I can teach what I have learned. And that is crucial because... Frankly, in the 1980s with AIDS, more in ballet than opera, but certainly all over the arts, there were many men mostly who died. And that connection, that there was a break in tradition where what was known by the older generation, especially men in ballet, vanished. Uh, we had this to some degree with COVID, not so much, but um, events happen in the world that mean that suddenly there's a blackout of information. And that's why I created this program. That's why so much of what I want to do is about passing down the knowledge of people such as yourself uh, so that it can be recorded and it can be heard and understood and thought about. So future generations of artists and audiences both can study this and, and come to understand what you do in your work. Um, so I'm very happy that you worked with conductors and she did. That's a wonderful thing to think about. Um, two of her characters that are your characters too, Leonora in Fidelio and Isolde, are very particular women. We'll get into Brunhilde later. I love Brunhilde, of course. But um, Isolde and Leonora are very decisive, very brave. Isolde may be kind of rash and metaphysical in ways that I would not want. <laughs> but Leonora to me is completely believable. And Anne Evans was so thrilling as Leonora because of her humane grounding, that you sense that as the wellspring. For some Leonoras, it's religion. For others, it's anger and defiance. But I think the closest to Beethoven and Schiller is the, the concept of humanity and, and being a humane person for all. And I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, and, and that's yeah. what shines out is that Leonora is without needing any other motivation from religion 
or some morality imposed by society. She is a genuinely good and heroic person. And have you already played her? I know it's listed for Bergen, Norway. Was that done already? I lose track with the pandemic or is that upcoming? No, no, no. I, I first performed Leonora back in 2013, I think, okay. in Bergen. Okay. And I've since revived that production several times in Vilnius because it was a co-production with um, the Lithuanian National Opera. So I've yeah. done it several times there. And in fact, we then did a pandemic project of Fidelio it was very unusually it was an extra job that happened because of the pandemic rather than a cancellation and I was lucky enough to do Leonora with Opera North in the UK yeah in the UK we we did a, a first attempt which got um our performances were turned into a live stream because we went into total lockdown I think the day after the dress rehearsal And then we, but Opera North was wonderful and they managed to rearrange the dates and we then performed them the following spring. So we've, we've, and I've also done the second half of Fidelio with Sir Mark Elder and the Halle in concert. So I've, I've done quite a bit of Leonoraing over the years. Let's file Sir Mark Elder because I want to get back to him. He will be my guest in May. Um, But two Leonora questions in Fidelio. One of them is, Many singers I know and have worked with say that one of the most fiendishly difficult arias in all of opera is Abscholicha because it's hard to negotiate the the writing of Beethoven. What's your feeling about that aria? No one ever told me it was difficult before I learned okay. it, so I've just always really enjoyed singing it in the way, right. exactly the same way that I always used to enjoy singing Comiscolio as Fior de Ligi. Yeah. Um, it's it's the same sort of thing. You've got lovely slow lyrical passages which are just dreamy to sing, and then really fast, exciting bits. I think and leaps because, and lots and of leaps. leaps. Yeah. <laughs> because I came to Fidelio from an early music background, I think I've retained enough agility to get round the runs. I think people who have potentially come to dramatic soprano repertoire from more standard lyrical repertoire might find that harder if they've left their runs further away in the past I was still having to get round Bach Mm -hmm. and Handel runs still shortly before I did my first video so for me it was possibly a little bit easier um I also don't use, the, if I say I don't want to unleash the full Isolde on Fidelio, I think it needs to sound like bigger Mozart rather than like little Wagner. So mm-hmm. therefore, I don't use the full weight of my voice. I don't drag it down too much into the middle. I try and keep it very young sounding and very slender. Um, little Wagner sounds like a program on the BBC. It does. <laughs> <laughs> so, Greetings yeah. I, little Wagner near the Thames. <laughs> I think I, I've always said about my early music singing that, you know, it, when I'm playing my violin, I don't play Bach in the same way that I play Brook. Mm-hmm. Um, most people probably prefer me not to try and do either anymore because I haven't practiced the violin properly for a very long time. But I think I, I try and play my voice a bit, my, bit like my violin. So I use what I hope is the right color for the composer. And that varies hugely. It's why I enjoy having my paint box and choosing technical things that that fit different pieces. So I don't find singing Abscholicher difficult, and I never have. I love singing Abscholicher. I find it very exciting. I I get very excited by the fast bit and the big scary scale at the end that everyone hates because I I it's kind of like working out where the hand and footholds are on a rock face. You know, it's that mm-hmm. kind of challenge, and that's the sort of thing I enjoy most. Here's my second Fidelio question. To me, one of the most beautiful sequences in all of opera is the prisoner's chorus. Oh, yeah. And many times it is staged so that Leonora is on stage, number one, looking for her husband, but number two, taking in the full impact of these imprisoned men and what they're dealing with. And it requires a huge amount of acting with no singing. And often the audience is and should be listening to the chorus and seeing the men come out. How do you, as Rachel, keep it together emotionally? But number two, how do you enact that scene 
which to me is like Elizabeth and Tannhäuser were looking for him in Act Three in the Pilgrim's Chorus. Um, how do you it? But it's integrated into the larger reality of the of this gorgeous chorus. I I suppose I don't try and hold it together is the first thing. I I would say that in I mean and it, I don't want to make these pronouncements which actually sound quite arrogant and, and I I don't want to come across as someone who thinks that she has the answer to any of these things because I just do it my own way. But I would say that I am a method actress, so. By a method actress, I what I mean by that is I, in the rehearsal process, find experiences of my own that I can tap into that will trigger emotional responses that are the same that the character will be feeling. By the time I'm on stage in a performance, it's gone way beyond me tapping into my own life experiences. And I would say I am genuinely experiencing the emotions that the character is experiencing on the stage. So when I'm on the stage with those prisoners, I am seeing those prisoners for the first time and I am absolutely horrified by what I am seeing. I'm desperate to find my husband and I am enormously moved with the biggest feeling of compassion I can find to try and to want to do something to make the life better for these people. I'm also frightened because I know some of them will be in prison for proper reasons. They're not all there um, necessarily um, unfairly. So there are lots of emotions going on. And obviously that will be to some extent dependent on what the actual production is that I'm working on. Um, there's also the feeling with Leonora that of course, she's in her own prison of not being able to express the person that she is. She's having to pretend to be someone else. And she has this she's agenda. She's pretending to be a young man to get her she way into the prison to work and she has to, to find her very husband. smart she has to be very smart yeah. and she has to manipulate someone who she actually is very fond of you know um, and and pers almost persuade this girl into marriage and she also has to manipulate Rocco who's the who's the jailer who's Marcelina's father and, and yeah. this is very very difficult for Leonora because she's a deeply moral person and she does not like lying but she does see the greater good and that she she must do these things so she's an incredibly complex character but i would say the prisoner's chorus is for me the emotional kind of boiling point where yeah. she absolutely you know, if if she was going to send up a prayer, that's when she would do it. But I think the thing about Leonor is, is she doesn't rely on a, a third party, however um, esoteric. She realizes that the buck has stopped with her, and she's going to have to do something herself. And that's what she, she does. Act. I mean, I agree with you, and I've seen productions that are very religious, and and a point could be made of that because in the second act. God and and all kinds of religion is God invoked in, 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 yeah, in a very major way. So I will accept that from the stage director <laughs> who decides that that's where he or she wants to go. But I also find Leonora more secular, yeah. as you say. Um, the first word out of Florestan's mouth, her husband is God, God but you know, God is dark in here. And why have you abandoned me? And so on. And then he has this reverie about Leonora, my angel, my angel, my, my angel. Yeah. So my angel is Leonora, which brings me to: Have you ever worked with a Floriston who's very heavy? It's a hard role, and not many men can sing it. Yeah. And you cast first for voice, but occasionally you have a man who does not look like he's been living on bread and water for two years. Well, yeah. Now this is. We're getting onto dangerous territory here because I don't want to be one of those people who body shame other singers. Nor and do I. Bit of a hot potato in the opera yeah. world, or or has been for the last fifteen years. Yeah, I can't quite remember when Dumpy Gate was. Yeah, um, where we, some very nasty male critics had some very nasty body shaming things to say about a wonderful Marshallin. It was an Octavian, wasn't it? It was, it was yeah. and. and right. Some nice things to say about her slightly slimmer counterpart playing the mar the Marshallin. Right. And it's, yeah, it, it's often you find that big voices come in big packages. I have mm -hmm. to say, 
personally, I've been on both sides of this because before I was ill, as I said, back in 2016, 17, I was much, much heavier than I am now. Um, and I was described as pneumatic, I think, in the press <laughs> for one particular <laughs> role. So people used to comment on my size in a negative way. Not, yeah. I didn't suffer hugely from it, but it was certainly commented on. Now people say, oh, I can't believe someone so little can make such a big noise because I, mean, I am yeah. tiny for the for the repertoire that I now sing. Um, and um, I'm tiny and fierce and extremely fit. Um, and that gets commented on as well. So I think singers often can't win. But yes, you're absolutely right. Often, you know, big voices come in big packages and you get a florist done who doesn't look like he has been starved um, and only given a tiny bit of bread and water and been living in the dark for 30 days. Well, <laughs> I, I knew I was friends with the wonderful late South African tenor, Johan Botha. What a glorious voice with beautiful, rich, honeyed voice and was a wonderful singer and a great man and very religious, by the way. And he and I would go out for meals and talk and so on. And after a performance of Fidelio, I asked him about that because there had been a big ripple of laughter in the audience. And he said, well, I would like to remind, I don't do a South African accent. I would like to remind them that if you're living on bread and water, it creates a lot of yeast. Perfect <laughs> <laughs> response. But let's go now to Isolde, a character that is legendary for many people. Tristan and Isolde is their favorite opera of all. The former chairman of the board of the Metropolitan Opera, James Marcus, who I revered, that was his favorite opera. And um, it's not necessarily mine, and that doesn't matter. I adore Wagner, and I will go anytime to a performance of Tristan and Isolde. But I have a hard time fathoming what happens in that opera, in part because basically she's angry at being removed from Ireland to Cornwall. Her maid, Brangaina, mixes drugs. She falls in love with Tristan. They have a very long, gorgeous duet in the the second act in the night watch king mark sings for 20 minutes then it's quite Tristan long that bit stabbed, yeah king mark's long song yeah and then uh he's stabbed by mellowed i think is his name yep and tristan dies for an hour with a gorgeous english horn music in the third act and then azolda shows up and has the a hit bit tune. too late she gets there just too late. <laughs> and so what is, I mean, I'm, this is a serious question. What's it about that opera? Okay, so the thing we have to remember about Tristan is that the thing has happened already when the opera starts. So the action has already happened and the action is really quite complicated. So Isolde was betrothed to a person called Morold and Morold and... Tristan had a fight and Tristan killed Morold. Tristan then disappeared, but then he reappeared disguised as somebody else called Tantris. That's right. And um, he'd been injured in this, in this fight. And Isolde, not realizing that he'd killed her fiance, nursed him back to health, but um, uh, found Tristan's sword and compared it with the splinter of the sword that she'd removed from Morold's head, presumably when she was preparing him to be buried, or I don't know, was he killed straight away? Don't know. Perhaps she tried to nurse him as well. Anyway, she realises that the splitter, this, this splinter of Morold's sword, uh, uh, sorry, of Tristan's sword fit, it's fitted exactly in the sword. And so obviously Tristan disguised as Tantris, he's been unmasked and she has the opportunity to stab him with his own sword because he is prone and vulnerable. And he looked into her eyes and she looked into his eyes and they fell in love with each other. Was that with the aid of uh, chemical substances or without? No, this was just... No. This was just like au naturel with no, okay. no weird drugs involved at all. Um, Tristan then goes away again and decides that the answer to this is that clearly he should woo Isolde again, but on behalf of his uncle. 
So what? Isolde's really quite cross at the beginning. <laughs> She's yeah. really quite cross because not only has this man killed her fiance, he fell in love with her. He then they didn't really get it together, and then he's gone away, and then he's he's sold her to his uncle. I mean, it's just awful. So no wonder she's a little bit angry. She's angry, um, but from a purely dramatic point of view, this is not an opera I've ever worked on a production on. Um, how do you stage that if there's so much backstory and pre-story yeah. so that it's if you problem. walk into the theater, how does the audience understand? I know that Wagner published in three sets, I believe, the, the act the libretto that people bought on subscription and read it but i don't know if he did a four story to say this is what happens before we meet our characters well i mean the good news for anybody who's worried about it is that isolde does explain at some length what has happened in the story she does a whole recreation of the narration and curse it's called where she tells the whole story to brangena and this is a, a device that's often used in operas is um Character explains to maid what has happened so audience can understand. Um, and Mezzo listens. <laughs> yes, exactly. Mezzo listens and interjects with sympathetic interjections a lot. Um, actually, Brangaina has some of the most beautiful, well, probably Brangaina has the most beautiful music to sing in Tristan, I think. And um, it's it's a wonderful role. Yeah. Um, she's much more than just a maid. But I do have to say, Brangaina had one job which was to which was to provide the death drink and she had another job later on which was to tell Isolde when King Mark is coming back and she completely fails on both counts so Brangaina is so fired as far as I'm concerned but does she do that intentionally or she's careless no she she intends to give Isolde the love potion instead of the the death potion sorry for the, for anybody who doesn't know the story of Tristan and Isolde um, long story short, Isolde decides she's so cross with Tristan and she so doesn't want to marry his uncle that she decides that they're both going to drink the death draft together and, and die because that would be a better fate. Only Brangaina thinks this isn't such a good idea and she loves Isolde. So she um, decides that she's going to provide the love drink instead of the death drink. Tristan and Isolde drink the love potion and either it's a real love potion and they fall in love because of that or they realise how they feel about each other, all the anger disappears and they begin this absolutely doomed affair. Isolde yeah. then has to marry King Mark anyway and it that's just, it doesn't end well. Should we just no. say that? Doesn't yeah. end well. I don't, don't, don't want to do spoilers in case anyone doesn't know what happens. Well, it doesn't end well for <laughs> Tristan. But what about yeah. Isolde? Well, who the, can say? Can she move, has she, and I mean this very seriously, achieved some kind of metaphysical peace? Or I, her Libus tone, as it's known, I don't think of it as a lamentation. No. I don't think of it as a, an emotional reconciliation. It's it's absolutely it's an emotional reconciliation. And by the end of it, she is transfigured and she yeah. is with Tristan, either spiritually or actually. Some productions she dies at the end, some productions she doesn't. Some productions he ends up being resurrected. You know, I've okay, done it so a number you're of different about dying at the end or not. Have you ever sung Elsa and Lohengrin? No. Is that's one okay. I missed out on the way, which I'm a bit sad about. Because <laughs> there's a great debate, does she die in the end or not? Do you yeah. have an opinion? Um not really. Yeah, I know. I don't want to pronounce on an opera. I've not investigated okay. fully. And I mean, I, it's an opera that I, I'm deeply connected to and have worked on a lot. But I still think that the jury is out as to whether she dies at the end or not. It's certainly not clear cut. The little I yeah. do know makes right. me totally agree with that. Yeah. But so maybe there's an orchard for you in the future. I hope so. Yeah, that would be a lovely, lo a wonderful, dramatic role. I, I teach that opera all the time. To me, she's an old believer. Yeah. And in the way that Marfa and Kovanchin is an old believer. But to me, similarly, Lohengrin is an old believer. He's a different kind of old believer. And we're juxtaposing two versions of the past. Yeah. Rather than a view of the future. Whereas other Wagner, well, the opera Lohengrin was des described as music of the future. But I still see it as linked to the past and the future came later with Tristan and Isolde and the ring. Let's get to the ring now. 
Um, you before were referring to the Valkyra Brunhilde, and yeah. professional Brunhildes I know all refer to her as three different women because the ring cycle has call it either a prelude in three operas or four operas. That's Brian Gold that yeah. Brunhilde's not in, uh, Die Valkyra that it's about her initially. Siegfried, where she has slept for 18 years, wakes up and sings him off the stage. And got it's to double. really great going on as <laughs> Hilda because up till then it's really just been all about tenors and the audience is really fed up of tenors and then you go on and you're a soprano and everyone's like yay! <laughs> um, and then there is the got to Dammering Brunhilde who is the boss of bosses. She's the you, boss. Let's talk now about the Siegfried Brunhilde because potentially for her and for them everything is happy because it ends in a deliriously high mood it potentially does it. Be, because i don't know does she know yet erda always comes up with bad news and, and foreboding but when she wakes up she's been sleeping she's been awakened by this young man who usually is good looking and he sings well and wagner wrote the awakening music for brunhilde in that opera is maybe the most pictorial music i know in all of opera yeah, and it's... you can feel the energy coming back into her body. Once I saw Dame Gwyneth Jones do it, where the eyes, it's as if they'd been sealed shut with fairy dust. She had to pry them open just with strength. She didn't use her hands and she didn't wipe her face. At the moment when you could feel the light pouring into her irises that had been closed for 18 years, she opened her eyes and they just sort of fluttered. And then the body was charged. It's like Falstaff getting Sherry in him. That suddenly everything became animated again. And Wagner put that in his music. Yeah. And talk from about that, music, that passage of acting when you're not singing, so to speak, and when you're sleeping. It's incredible. And I, I've I've done the Siegfried Brunhilde more in concert than I have done it on stage. And in concert... I mean, the, fir the first time I did it for, for Sir Mark Elder, I had to stand for the whole of that scene. <laughs> absolutely still like a statue. He didn't want me to have my eyes shut, but I had to stand absolutely like still. And then as the music started, I had to reanimate. And it was the most brilliant acting challenge. I loved it. I loved the challenge of having to stand there completely still. It only occurred to me when we were about to start the performance that I thought, oh, oh, I'm not going to have sung for quite a long time, am I? I'm going to be sort of completely silent. I was what's that going to do to my voice? But it was fine. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, singers, we like to, you know, check everything's still yeah. working just, just before we sing. But no, there was no chance for that at all. So that was a bit scary, but it was, it was incredible. That music, you feel it. And particularly if you are doing it in concert, because you're usually on the same level as the orchestra. Obviously, when we're in the theatre, we're on the stage and they're in the pit where they belong. So they're not too loud. But if you actually have the visceral experience of standing in the middle of all of these orchestral players, hearing that reanimation music, you feel it go into your body and it's like you're becoming charged up. It's incredible. Mm. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And then got to Damerung Brunhilde. To me, is just she's everything. She yeah. So in Siegfried, she's, we said, you said, is she happy? Nah, she's not happy. No, why she's not? She's still really, really tortured about falling out with daddy. Uh -huh. So, Even after was, 18 years? Even after 18 years. The last thing that happened to her was Votan sealed her eyes and sealed her in sleep, singing his Abschied, which is the most glorious music ever written, yeah. I think. I, yeah. I, it's just the most moving, incredible thing. For whenever I'm, if I'm feeling really, really sad, I just make my husband sing it to me and I play the piano <laughs> in a lovely, loud time and, and it, it makes us, everything feel better. Um, it's good to have a baritone in the house. Isn't yeah, it? he can be handy sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we, it's, yeah, so the last thing that happened was Brunhilde was, was put to sleep by Wotan. And when she wakes up, yeah, she's bowled over by the amazingness that is Siegfried and, and realizing who Siegfried is and the fact that she is responsible for him being there because if she hadn't saved his mother, he wouldn't be there to rescue her. And this incredible feeling of 
completion and the fact that the fates have all aligned to make this happen is incredible. But then she realizes that she's not the person who went to sleep because she's not a goddess anymore. And she realizes that she has lost her godhead and that she's Brunhilde bin ich nicht mehr, she sings. She's traumatized mm-hmm. by the fact that he's taken away, Wotan has, has taken away her divinity. And she has to recognize herself as a human. And then she has to tap back into that experience she had with Siegmund and the way that he saw she saw him with Sieglinde and work out what human love is. And there is only half an hour, you know, that she's on stage in Siegfried. Yeah. So it will happen quite quickly. <laughs> but yeah. And by the end of it, she is very honest because Brunhilde is incredibly honest. That's her thing. She doesn't dress anything up and she tells Siegfried how she is feeling and why. And of course, Siegfried, who is perhaps not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I no. mean, he's, he's the holy fool. Siegfried is is inherently incredibly good not that bright, hence all the problems that happen in Goethe Demering. But he, he's a very good person and he just dismisses all of Brunhilde's worries about how she's not good enough because she's not a god anymore and how everything is very sad because she's fallen out with her dad. And Siegfried is sort of, oh, never mind, I'll make it all better. And, and at the end she goes, okay, then brilliant. And then they have this wonderful, passionate duet. I, about 25 years ago, was interviewing the general manager of a very important opera company on a stage in front of an audience of donors and patrons who are giving money to that theater. And he raised, I don't ask the question, who's your favorite character in opera or who do you identify with? But he raised it and he explained that his favorite character is Siegfried. And I could not bring myself to say that, as you said, he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer He's kind of stupid. <laughs> He's innocent. Is, is, I, when we talk I, about... just, I just left it there for the audience to take in. <laughs> I could see checkbooks closing at that yeah. point. <laughs> the thing um, about Siegfried is he's got no experience. Yeah. That doesn't help if you're a general manager. No. And he's he might not be stupid in the end, but he is an innocent and doesn't understand evil he doesn't understand lying he doesn't understand any of these things because he doesn't have them in his own heart so therefore he's and he doesn't have fear in his heart and i think that this general manager was implying that he admired the fearlessness of siegfried but fearlessness because of stupidity is not the same as fearlessness with knowledge and i would say that's how he differs from brunhilde because she is knowledgeable and fearless so and she keeps learning. She does. So whenever I have a, a difficult time in my life, my mantra is, what would Brunhilde do? Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, late in, in the cycle, she says, alles weiß ich. Now I yeah. know everything. Yeah. And she acts on her knowledge in and very courageous ways. She saves the courageous. universe by riding into a funeral pyre with a ring on her finger. And that's incredible. Uh, do you do it on a horse or you lead the horse in? How does that work? Um, the Grana. most exciting incarnation I've done was the Fura del Baus production, which I did in Tai Chung. I know that production, um, yeah. And I got to fly into the flames on a yep. crane. Yep. Over the orchestra. So I saw that in Valencia and in Florence. It was quite something. It's yeah. The most incredible production. What I will say is, I, I've, I think I've, I've hinted already that I'm, I'm very small for a Brunhilde. And the previous person who'd done it, and I don't even know who it was, was a much taller and broader lady than me. And she had a bigger bust than me. We had sent them my measurements, but they obviously hadn't really looked at my measurements. And when they tried the costume on, it was comical. I mean, really comically huge. And in the end, they, um, they had to make me a dress out of the skirt because I'm 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 so small. I'm, I'm five, five foot five on a really good day with a following wind, and I've got no bust at all. For those of you who, who haven't seen me, 
The thing they could do nothing about was the breastplate, which was made of moulded fibreglass. So it was hilarious because I looked like a cartoon. I was this tiny little person in this tiny little skin tight dress with this enormous fibreglass bust. It was absolutely like a tortoise. Brilliant. Yeah, it was yeah. absolutely brilliant. Um, I wish I did have that figure in real life, but sadly not. <laughs> um, so Sir Mark Elder who I met once, literally once on a street in New York City. I stopped him and chatted with him. It was very nice. And I've arranged to have him on next month. Um, is a big lover of, as I am, Sir Edward Elgar. And it turns out they have the same birthday. I didn't know that. And you, as many of my guests do, give uh, some suggestions for Idadjo listeners and we have Puccini and Strauss and Bach and Elgar and Ravel. But specifically, you chose the concerto for violin and orchestra. Now I know that you play the violin. Um, with Yehudi Menuhin playing and Elgar conducting from 1932. Talk yeah. about that work and Elgar and Mark Elgar, well, if you wish. Yeah. So firstly, about, about Sir Mark, I have just finished working with him in Basel. We were, in fact, doing the Siegfried um uh, act three. And every time I work with Sir Mark, I am again inspired and just, oh, I the one who used the word gobsmacked by his talent, but also his knowledge and his level of preparation and also his knowledge about singing and singers. So the first time I worked with him on some Wagner, I think he the, the phrase he used was that I was committing vocal suicide was what he was saying. It says how he put it. And he explained to me that the the whole thing about Wagner using bel canto singers and that I needed to adopt a much more bel canto approach with my own singing. And actually do a minuscule portamento in between absolutely every single note and Explain i portamento portamento is a slide so what sir mark is saying is that i mean it's a peculiarity to do with me and that they say how do you know when someone's got perfect pitch and the answer is they'll tell you five minutes after they meet you um yeah <laughs> my superhero skill is that i know what the notes are in my head <laughs> And as a result of that, sometimes <laughs> I can be guilty of just singing an A because it's an A and then a D and then a G and not really thinking about how those notes relate to each other. And I think what Samart was trying to tell me was that I wasn't singing with enough line and I wasn't really moving as smoothly as he'd like from note to note. And, and, and in order to facilitate what he wanted, he said, I want you to actually slide between every single note. I want you to go away and I want you to practice doing that and then I want you to come back. And, you know, that was a very, possibly not the most helpful timing the day before the performance, mm -hmm. because I didn't have very much time to, to put that into, into practice. However, since that conversation with Sir Mark, I've had a good five years to put that into practice. And I now hope that that is more what I do. Mm -hmm. I don't leave all of the slides in. I take some of them out because otherwise it would sound a little bit mannered, potentially. But I leave some of them in. Whereas mm. you know, I used to really think that singing needed to be very clean and that notes needed to be right in the middle all the time and that we should just move from one to the other without any kind of ease and oiling the mechanism. And I found it vocally an incredible journey to enjoy exploring that idea. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very, very grateful to Samar because that's something I use every single day in my singing that he made a chance remark to me at a rehearsal and although it was a bit sad at the time to be told that I was committing vocal suicide I think it's in yeah. the long run been a very good thing for me to hear uh, mm. <laughs> um, but he's he's an incredible musician and what I admire so much is that he has thought about every single note in the score and he's whole interpretation hangs together as a cohesive whole. And that's not always the case with conductors, but you can definitely tell it is Sir Mark Elder's interpretation. And I think that is a legacy he is going to leave us forever. He recently those... conducted, I'm sorry, in Washington, the Mahler Ninth Symphony with the mm. National Symphony Orchestra. I did not get to hear it, but it was one of those performances that people are saying that if you were there, you were at something phenomenal. And 
and unlike anything they'd heard before. And people I know who are very experienced hands at music have said they've never heard a Mahler ninth like that one. No, and it, he he is that kind of epic musical figure. I think his works are seminal. You know, it, it, what he does is actually genius. And I think we know when we're in the presence of genius. And I think it's the biggest privilege in the world to have been asked to be Brunhilde in the Siegfried that he was conducting. And I, it's an ex- I, I have to say on a personal level, I have never sung so well in my life as I, mm-hmm. as I sang in that concert. And that was entirely down to his genius. So it was a great, great privilege. Um, so have- another serious question that you, I love, Rachel, that you're bringing all the stuff out of me that really is very exciting. I have been asked often, Fred, you must have met many geniuses in your life. And my reply is, I can only think of two where I was aware that I was in the presence of a genius. Have you met more geniuses than two in your life? He's the one that really stands out Mm -hmm. for me. I think the other person I think is a genius is Richard Jones. Okay. Stage director. The stage director, Richard Jones. Yeah. I I cannot fathom how his brain works to conjure up the images that he does. And I find him endlessly fascinating. I love working with him. I get initially frustrated with the level of detail he wants to work in and then it's all I want to do for the rest of my Mm -hmm. life is to is to work in that level of detail and I think yeah I think he's a genius too those are the two people to me that I have met and been fortunate enough to actually spend time with and talk to that are total geniuses I I won't name the name but I've known many 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 conductors who I think are brilliant and fascinating and inspiring and so on only one of them I've found to be what I think would call a genius. The other genius I've met is not in music at all, to my knowledge. Um, she's a mathematician, and her mind goes in directions that I will never comprehend. She's able in her head to replicate the growth of cancer cells and understand how to address cancer by understanding how they grow, all through math. And that to me is a level of genius. And she's helped bring about cures for different forms of cancer through her knowledge of mathematics, which to me is just astonishing. That's incredible. Uh, Yeah. But um, talk about Edward Elgar before we conclude, because he's one of my very favorites and he's considered to non-British people to be very British, whatever that is. Quintessentially British. Yeah. Yes, And yet I'm not British, but I love the music of Edward Elgar it's it's honest music it's music from the heart and in fact Elgar was not particularly well respected because he didn't have a posh background like a lot of his contemporaries and I think there is there is a story and I might be getting this wrong but he he decided he was going to write a fugue to prove to people that he could actually write proper academic clever intellectual music um I think he's at his best when he lets his melodies spin free form i have to say and the i was um i was advised when preparing for this program not to fall down the rabbit hole of just looking at the adagio catalog and get, and and obsessing about what pieces would of course the first thing i did was to go to the adagio catalog and start obsessing yeah. about what recordings i liked of different pieces and it took me a long time to settle on my five tracks that i was going to mm-hmm. select but I saw that Elgar was conducting this one. And of course, Menuhin was playing. Now, my grandfather was a watercolour painter and he very tragically lost his sight. Mm. And he used to, instead of painting, he, his creativity found an outlet in that he used to, he had a state-of-the-art um, sound system, which was a cassette recorder as well. And he used to probably illegally record things that he thought would go together to make up beautiful concerts from the radio. And 
when he died, he died when I was five, having worked out that I had perfect pitch and told to, after telling my parents that I really must be made to learn lots of instruments, which I, I did. Um, so it's pretty much entirely due to my two granddads that I ended up doing what I do because my other granddad used to pay for all of my music lessons and um, gave <laughs> me his violin when I was big enough to play a full size violin yeah. and then bought me my lovely violin, which I still have. Um both incredible people and incredible musicians, both of them in their own way. But Grandad, I, I I grew up listening to Grandad's Menuhin recording off, you know, he's recorded off Radio 3 of Menuhin playing the Elgar mm-hmm. Bionic Shed. And I don't know if it is actually this same recording, but it's certainly very similar. And it, it felt like coming home because it's what I, what I used to listen to in my bedroom, wishing I was good enough to play it. And there's something about Menuhin's um combination of musicianship and showmanship that I think is just brilliant it's very very flamboyant and Mm -hmm. unapologetically flamboyant and I love it (laughs) you were talking about people artists who lose their sight Uh I was named for three Fredericks and one of them was Frederick Delius the British composer who lost his sight and I was raised on the legend of that and, and how he worked around this as a composer by, in effect, dictating what was in his head to someone else who transcribed it and put it down. And, um, you know, when I in America tell people I'm named for three Fredericks and one of them is Delius, almost no one knows who that is. That's tragic because, again, you know, I wish I could have included Delius in my five tracks because he's another yeah. one of my favorites. This lovely english sound yeah it is even though he spent a lot of time in america yeah and wrote the florida suite which is a wonderful piece and lots of music evoking african americans in the old south um you mentioned the bach goldberg variations which is something that many people have included but you're the first person not to include glenn gould but instead rudolph serkin yeah i'm grateful and I'm, (laughs) i'm happy for that why rudolph serkin um I actually love the sound of the piano he is playing is mm-hmm. one of the reasons. Um, don't get me wrong. I love the Glenn Gould recording. It's a little bit too fast for my personal taste. I, mm-hmm. I, I haven't got time to assimilate all of the Bach's information with Glenn Gould, even though it's incredible piano playing. Um, with this particular recording, I'm just in awe of the freedom in the phrasing and the use of the pedal, which is from a time before historical performance sanitized early music forever. And the virtuosity seems kind of loose and effortless in a way that I think is extremely sexy. So of all of the recordings available on Adagio, this was my favorite. And I feel that it's sort of speaking to me from 1928 of a time before we all had to totally sing with no vibrato and not use the pedal. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You only chose one opera production and it was Zalome. Now my Scandinavian pronunciation is often errant. So Malin Boostrom, I think is the correct pronunciation, B-Y-S-T-R-O-M. Um, in what I think is a live performance from Amsterdam that the Elegati conducting. Why that one of all the operas you could have chosen? Um, I think Zalame represents to me my, I suppose it's my musical education. The first time I heard this scene, my husband said, this is the best music I've ever heard. And I listened to it and I went, this is just a wall of sound. I don't understand it. And then I was asked to sing Zalame. And I got to know the, the piece, the, the Schlussgesang, the, the ending where Zalame is singing to John the Baptist's head. And of course, now I think it's the best music ever written because I just needed to spend a little bit of time with it. Um, what I love about this is Daniele Gatti. Now, I was uh, very fortunate to sing as older for Daniele Gatti in, in Paris, in at the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées, and then again in Rome in the beautiful Pierre Audi production. Yeah. And he is one of the best technical conductors, as well as being an amazing force for good in terms of music. 
um, that I've ever worked with. The thing about Daniele Gatti is he's very exciting to work for because he will take risks in performance, particularly if you have a really good understanding. And I would look at him and he would look at me and he'd dare me to do something exciting and I would dare to do the exciting thing. And it was, it was absolutely thrilling to do that. And I can hear that that is what is going on in this performance of Salome. Um, the other thing about Gatti is he's such a technically brilliant conductor that I could turn around, do a headstand, four cartwheels and run around the stage. And then I'd look back and I'd know precisely what beat he was on because he is so clear. I often think that um, conductors should have to pass an MOT every year, um, demonstrating that the downbeat is MOT? down. Uh, it's it's the thing that cars have to pass, a safety test in the UK <laughs> that cars have to pass every year. In order, uh, well, after they're three years old, in order for you to be allowed to drive them, and I think conductors should have this as well. So they should be able to have to demonstrate that the downbeat goes down, and it isn't mm -hmm. to be confused with the upbeat that must go up. And if they do that, we might have some idea about when we're supposed to sing. Um, there we are. Um, <clears throat> I love you all, conductors, <laughs> really. But so, Gatti is brilliant. So I don't think I've ever gone through all five works with an artist before, but you have such good answers on each one. We're going to do it. Okay. Ravel Concerto for Piano and Orchestra in G Major. Yeah. The second movement only, it seems. Christian Zimmermann, Pierre Boulez, Cleveland Orchestra. Yeah. Why that one? Um, When I first heard this piece, I was driving home from Milton Keynes, the um, experimental town, um, after a day's teaching. And I'd nearly got home and I heard this piece on the radio and I was so moved by it that I burst into tears and turned my car around and drove back to Milton Keynes where there was a music store and had to buy the CD. And I then proceeded to obsessively listen to it for about a month of listening to nothing else. I got completely obsessed with it. And it was, in fact, this recording that I was listening to. Uh. And I, I just I love it. It's. It's kind of empty and desolate. And this particular recording is so brave with how slow the adagio is that it totally pushes all of my buttons in terms mm -hmm. of making me cry. And I cannot listen to it to this day without bursting into tears. I just love it so much. And finally, Puccini's Chrysanthemum, Chrysanthemum in, in the form for string quartet. Um, why opera composer he this is music that fed into Manon Lescaut but why yeah. particularly this work I first heard it at a concert um and I didn't know it was by Puccini it was, I, I was sat in in the audience without a program and I, I I just couldn't couldn't process how beautiful this music was and of course when I found out it was Puccini it completely made sense but I didn't even know he'd written a string quartet um yeah. and the what I love about this particular recording is that the subtlety of the dynamics that the Hagen Quartet have, have been brave enough to to do very, very subtly is somehow at odds with the incredibly indulgent tempo. And I can't quite work out how they are sustaining the lines, but they are. And I just think it's a really brave interpretation of this of this piece, which is to me, it's a perfect piece. It's kind of it's elegiac. I mean, it, it it's it's very sad. Chrysanthemums, particularly in Italy, represent death. Yes. And you can tell that this is a very tragic piece, but it's kind of perfect in its little microcosm on 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 tragedy. And I just think it's perfect. Puccini. I wish I could sing you. I don't sing you really. I I only sing um, German repertoire. I wish I could sing Puccini because is there sing. any Puccini you think you could do? I'd People like who do your music are often offered to and don't. I would say maybe Giorgetta in Il Tabaro. Both of which interest me immensely. Anybody who'd like to book me for those, I'm well up for learning them. Start with Giorgetta <laughs> because. Turandot is very unlikable. <laughs> Great music, but such an obnoxious person. Oh, she's awful. Yeah, absolutely yeah. dreadful. Um, the, the character interests me less than the music. Yeah. I think I think all sopranos would secretly like to be Tosca, wouldn't they? And I I'm I'm sort of the tragedy of my life is that it's probably never going to happen unless I set up a company called Vanity Opera so that I can be Tosca and my husband can be Garbia. 
well he has actually sung Scarpia but I don't think I'm ever going to be Tosca which is very very sad but I'll just have to console myself with being Isolde and Brunhilde and Zalame right. and Lectra and actually my life's not too bad <laughs> I have heard numerous glorious Wagner and sopranos who are not very good Toscas because <laughs> it's they were too oriented toward the style and the the intentions and the speed of the German operas and the Italian aesthetic is completely different and yeah and the Italian while. aesthetic it, is something I need to learn much 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 more about I mean not yeah. not just because I because I would like to be able to sing it I don't think I will sing Italian repertoire but I I'm fascinated by it German repertoire for me, there's a certain directness about the sound. And it it for me, there's something similar about the tone production itself, which is actually feeding from my early music roots and singing with a blade on the front of the sound, not too much vibrato, keeping the sound very slender and direct, but then tapping into the middle colours in the very low set passages. I I find is instinctively right for me, whereas Italian music goes around more corners. It yes. requires more floating. There's all sorts of things that it requires that I am not very good at. So I love to hear other people doing it well. <laughs> Have a look at Minnie and La Fanchula del West. I think that might be an interesting thing. And your husband can sing Jack Rance. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and your dog can play the horse. <laughs> yeah, my dog is asleep on the sofa at the moment with her oh. her, her hoop, her ring. Um, yeah, round one of her paws. It's very cute. <laughs> Rachel Nichols, this has been a wonderful visit. I thank you. And I look forward to meeting you in person and hearing you again. And uh, you've really educated me and our audience. And this is what I think of as a very good Friday. Um, so be well. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I've had a wonderful time. So thank you so much, Fred. And a happy Friday, good or otherwise, to everybody. Thank you.